Today on The State of Us, are you spending time on the right things? Five questions to determine what matters most. Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only, your friendly redneck liberal and the senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance Jackson. Today, we're figuring out what matters most. In other words, are you spending time on the right things? Well, how do we figure that out? We first need to know what matters most to you. And if we know that, then you'll have the easy answer to, are you spending time on the right things? Our values, the things that are most important to us, like work, family, friendship, creativity, and so on, are open to interpretation. What kind of work? Family in what sense? Friendship with whom? Just muddling along may work well enough until we have a conflict of goals or a crisis to deal with. But when we confront challenges, getting more specific about what we really value lets us know what's at stake in our choices. No problem, Lance, right? That's a tough one. I mean, it really is. <laughs> you know, it makes total sense is, okay, you need to sit down and figure out what's really important to you. That can be a hard question. I mean, you know, how many how many things do you have and are they equal? And that's where you start to sort it out. And But you have to, to the point of the article, you need to do that first because the second, third, fourth, and fifth questions don't mean anything if you don't have that perspective of, okay, this is what I value now. Okay. That means I do this. And if your values are fluctuating, like on one day, this is important. And on the next day, this other thing is important. And then that I could see, they don't make this connection in the article, but that could lead to some depression or some, you know, negative attitudes because, well, yesterday I was working on everything that was important to me. But today, something else is important to me, and I'm not working on that. So you really have to pin down what it is that you value in life and what, why you wake up every morning. What, what, what are you doing? Right. And so how do we do that? How do we decide what we actually value? Because, again, that's something that, and I think they kind of point that out, if you just asked you know, a handful of people, what do you value? You'd probably get something, right, along the lines of family, friends, work, you know, maybe a hobby that they might list. You'd get kind of this this set of very generic terms, but like, as it points out, in what sense are we talking about those things? You say you value family. Well, what does what does that mean? You know, what does family mean to you? And basically the way that they uh, and also materially what matters to you. You know, I mean, let's not forget we are material creatures. Uh, so it's not to say that things that aren't material can't matter, but we do have, most of us have stuff in our lives that we care about that make us happy and, or give us some kind of satisfaction. So like Madonna, you know, she was a material girl living in a material oh world. My gosh. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's good. We got the dad jokes on the show here, but, uh, let's talk about the first thing to do to figure out what you value. Try a thought experiment. Lance loves a good thought experiment. So that's what we're going to start with. This one's easy though, folks. Let's uh, take the most basic form of introspection and ask yourself, what do I value? Now, okay, right, this seems obvious, but let's let's turn it a little bit to figure out what do you value. So Lance, what would you grab from your home if it were on fire and you had to get out fast. So for the purpose of this scenario, realistically, it has to be stuff that you could carry with you. Like you're not going to run in and out of the house multiple times, right? And it's on fire. So you need to get out and stay out. So that's the question. What, what do you grab? Your house is on fire. You have time to grab a handful of stuff. What do you take with you? You got, you got a few things in your house, right? See, oh, I got more than a few. I, I This is so hard because it's... <laughs> I mean, you said, well, this, you is, grab an, your wife this is an easy question. Well, come on. Or? The article even says <laughs> you assume that your pets and your family can get out. Okay. Um, so we don't so, have to so count them. I don't think you count them. I think that's the author, the, Lance. Because, One of the great things about writing is they wrote it and then they realized that they forgot about their wife yeah. and said, okay, well, we got to put in that we're going to assume that they can get out. You know, and I, and I, and I, I don't want to really give the canned ans- answer, but I think. 
old family pictures are probably the first thing. Because okay. you know albums, and they're in albums, right? You can't so you can them. grab the album, right? Because you look, because I, I I've reached that age where I get them out and I look at them, and the rush of memories, you know, are are come back. Um, so I guess that would be where it is. I, I don't know that, you know. I mean, I have autographed sports paraphernalia. I have old books. Um. Again, I would probably grab the book of poems that my father wrote for my daughter. And then that was the only grandchild he had before he passed away. And But then I have printed the poems. There was one per day for the first year of their life. And I gave them to subs, I gave a copy of the book to subsequent grandkids. So you don't, you didn't know your grandfather. But here's what he wrote about his first and only grandchild in his life, and he would have felt the same way about you. So, again, it's it, it is I guess it's that family piece, <sighs> you know. Okay, so you grabbed the photo album. What I, else? I, you I grab, well, there's more than one. That's I mean, there, I can okay. make two or three trips. My family's big into pictures. My dad was a photographer. <laughs> you know, there's pictures of me when I was a little kid, and my daughters when they were little. So I would grab the photo albums, and I would probably grab the book of poems that my dad wrote for all the grandkids. Okay. That's probably what I If you I could regret. take anything else, you still had room in your arms. Oh, I wouldn't have room for my arm. I don't know. I, <laughs> I wouldn't have room for my arms. I wouldn't have room for my arms. <laughs> How you carry um, them without arms. That's impressive. Probably grab. That's like a, uh, you the, know, the, something the, you the, the bought. Bill, the, you... the Bill Mazeroski autographed bat okay. and the Bob Gibson <laughs> Hall of Fame autographed baseball. Okay. That was, well, <laughs> and then you've got the Stan Musial autographed ball oh. and you have the four seats that are autographed by Cardinal Hall of Famers that played in Bush Stadium One. Because that's a limited edition. Sounds like you're going to have to make some choices. Yeah, well, that's why, that's why I stopped where I did. And you said, well, what else can you get? I, you know, the bat, because it's the bat. I have a lot of autographed baseballs, but Bob Gibson was my idol. But okay, it would be the so family stuff the first. And, and yeah, the, the bat and the ball, I think, would be. Well, <laughs> Did you think of something it's else? It's not in the photo album, but I've got a <laughs> personalized autograph from Mickey Mantle. Oh. So. That probably well, needs to I, go, I, I too. I met him outside of the stadium in Columbus. Can't replace that. Right. Also have an autograph ball from Reggie Jackson that I caught his home run in batting practice and then stood after the game <laughs> in Cleveland and got him to sign it. And he signed right. The really cool thing is Reggie Jackson took it, turned the ball, and instead of signing on the sweet spot where it's really open, yeah. he signed right over the commissioner of baseball's name. Yeah. He signed right over the commissioner's <laughs> name and handed me back the ball as a 20-year-old and goes, I'm more important than he is anyway. <laughs> so, I, you know, I mean, again, brings back stories. So the things I would would grab – would be the ones that bring back the strongest memories of things. And that would be family for me. Gotcha. So nothing from the kitchen's going. No, we can replace all that. <laughs> no clothes. No. Yeah. <laughs> everything, no. Every, everything in my closet is, my entire wardrobe is either from the youth center or from coaching. <laughs> I, I have no distinct wardrobe. It's all yeah. coaching shirts and youth center shirts. Yeah. And I'm down to like two pairs of pants now because... I don't teach anymore. And <laughs> so I, I don't need all I, don't, I never was a clothes hound. I just no. never really was. It wasn't important to me. Yep. You know, you talk about what's, I mean, I was thinking of this question and to me, what was important to me and has been my whole life and where I'm struggling now is to serve other people. That was always, okay, is what I'm doing serving someone else who needs help? Somebody who needs help more than I need it. Right. Am I doing something? And that's to what help I've them? spent my life doing. And as I think back, I did that even as a little boy. I would help the neighbors. I would without without any intent of getting paid or getting anything. It was just inside of me or drilled inside of me by my grandparents and my parents to help other people. Whether they were less than me or more than me, it didn't matter. You just help other people. 
Um, and my struggle is now I'm getting older and a lot of times I'm looking back and I did a lot of things to help other people and maybe wasn't always there for my family. Mm. And so now my struggle is I still have this desire to help others, but this idea of I want to spend time with my wife and kids is starting to win out. And then now personally, that's a struggle for me. And so is that wrong? I don't know. I mean, again, that's my. Right. Well, that's, about, that's why you asked When it, you talk that's about why you values, asked the questions. you know, I mean, it's really funny. I have all this material stuff. Mm -hmm. But, but there's my, really not a lot of it. But my values, yeah, there's not a lot of it that means anything. It's because, again, I think it's because I didn't have a lot of things when I was growing up. Yeah. And so I collect stuff because it's like I never had stuff. So what about you? You got you don't have as much stuff, but you, I don't have as much but, but stuff. You, so that you, that helps. <laughs> you've got you've got side you've between. got books and typewriters and I, oh, I mean you have a lot of yeah, old that's stuff. True. You did oh <laughs> yeah. Well, this I, is, I so, have a collection of typewriters I, that you've never seen. I, right. That I keep I, meaning to bring uh, you over to show I you. I know. Uh, it's, see, that's what I struggle with. Is like my wife would be ecstatic if you show up one day and <laughs> and just. Take all of them and see, you know, God. yeah. That might be worth a million dollars worth of typewriters. It might be worth 10 cents. But right. if you take them out of the house, she, I'll win you know, points. You, oh, you would win okay. mucho points. Oh, well, good. Um, yeah, I mean, boy, much like Lance, I think it's difficult because when you think about, again, the what can you realistically take with you? Like, you know, there's there's some things that like, well, I'm not, I probably can't carry that, so... <laughs> alone so i'm not well, see, that's taking why I skip that my typewriter collection uh, right I, I, I can get one of them you, you, mm -hmm. right and then i can't probably get anything right <laughs> i can get else. a typewriter and lug something else if we're talking about material stuff then definitely i mean the the challenge is deciding which books to take right. that's really the challenge um, because the problem is that the collection has become substantive enough now that it's it, there was a time where it's like well the books that are important, I can definitely carry. So like, I'm just going to grab those and take them. But now it's, um, for our listeners that don't know, I collect old books, rare books, um, specifically American history type books uh, and, and world history. I guess I would aim for the books that I haven't been able to locate anywhere else in that maybe they're junk to people, which is part of why I have them, you know, which is the truth. Um, but to some people, they're not junk. And I have a hard time with one of the reasons I buy some of the books I have is not because I think it's a great book, but because it's like this, this may be the only copy of this book that still exists, you know? So if it gets destroyed now, like it's gone, it's extinct. Right. Yeah. And, and somebody spent a lot of time and energy wants to create this. And if I put that much time and energy, I would hope that somebody somewhere would want to save my book. I guess from that standpoint, like I can, I can narrow it down to probably five or six books that I would for sure grab. Like I have, I have an autographed, you know, a signed first edition of the privately printed um, Henry Adams book. He was the last of the direct descendants of John Adams who died in 1919. And he privately published a book in the early, like I think it was 1912 for his friends. And it's a letter to teachers of American history. It is fascinating. I mean, one, it's super heady. I mean, you have to really, it's, it is like trying to read a philosophy book, you know, with somebody who has a ton of modern grammar sense. So it's just, there's a lot going on, but it's a small little green backed book and it's in, you know, nice shape and his autograph or his, you know, signature is, is on the cover page. Um, and it's inscribed to one of his friends, you know, so that's, remember folks, Justin started this with saying, oh, this is an easy question, right? That, that's eight, eight. And, and we've, and you know, he's like, oh, well, which book do I take? You know? And I'm like, well, I'll take albums and a book of poems that my dad wrote for the grandchildren. Yeah. And then after that, you know, when you start to really think about it, what is valuable? I mean, the, the unrealistic thing about this scenario is that there's not time to think through all this stuff. You know, it's like the house is on fire. So well, I, I think of it, like, those, oh, those, those things that I mentioned, I'm not even sure where they are in the house. <laughs> you know, so I'm not sure I could run to get <laughs> If there them. was a fire. Yeah, could, if I could even where locate them. So he's in the house looking for the things that were important. I mean, does that tell you, you know, but I know where the family albums are and yep. I know where the book of poems are the original book of I'll see see I know where those two I know where those things are yep 
And then, and probably the third thing, and I just thought of this again, are the handwritten recipes that my grandma sent ah. to my mom. Mm -hmm. And I've got the originals. Yep. In my grandmother's handwriting of all the things I cook at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Well, what else other than this book would I say? There are a couple things. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. So other than the living things in the house, so far I've only saved one item. <laughs> So that's easy. I'm probably going to get out you just can, fine. Carry it. Yeah. And it's a small book, too. I got some heavy books, and that's not one of them. I would also definitely save there's a small box um, in our closet that is from when uh, Brett and I first started dating. Um, and we wrote lots of, I wouldn't even say letters. They're like lots of little notes. Like we had different sticky notes and little post-it cards and stuff that we would leave because we had different work schedules. We still do, but... We had very different work schedules. And so like you leave a little note or something, not for any particular reason. I mean, sometimes it was a practical thing, but sometimes it was just a nice, you know, I'll be thinking about you while I'm at work or whatever. I would probably save that box because that has, you know. Memories. Yeah, that has important value. I, I came across it the other day and looked through it and I'm like, I really need to read this more because <laughs> this stuff makes me happy. So Exactly. You know, so that's one of those like, uh, again. But that's part of your And values. I know where that is. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I know right... I haven't opened it in a while, but I know where it is. And if I had to save something, I would definitely want to save that. I wouldn't save any clothes. I don't think there's really any furniture that I would save. Um, or any, and again, if I saved furniture, I couldn't couldn't save anything else. Yeah, that's that's probably mostly it. I, I would now if you know in this whole world of if. Uh, Brett was able to also save things, and I would assume that one of the things he would save is his bassoon, for people that know about uh -huh. instruments. But if he wasn't going to save it, I sure would, would save it. Right. I would save it. Not because I can't play the instrument, but I like hearing him play it. I would want to save it because, I would. one, it's expensive. Like, of everything I mentioned, it's probably the most dollar value item of all those things and also because it's an antique and i like antiques and i like him playing it so like there's a lot of things there with i would assume he would save it because it's probably one of his more valuable possessions but if he didn't save it then i'd definitely be grabbing that so <laughs> but it's not an easy question no but that to your point if we don't answer this first one then the others kind of don't matter and i'm very asseverate when i say that that's our word of the day, asseverate. Ah. A-S-S-E-V-E-R-A-T-E. -E -E. It's a verb. It means to affirm or declare positively or earnestly. Asseverate. Mm -hmm. The example, during her Emmy acceptance speech, Viola Davis asseverated her stance on the lack of minority roles in Hollywood. And interestingly enough, sharing writing evidence in a 2001 article in the New York Times the novelist Elmore Leonard, who I enjoy reading very much, wrote that he had to stop reading to get the dictionary when he encountered she asseverated instead of she said in a work by Mary McCarthy. We say with all seriousness that asseverate is a fancy word meaning to assert or declare. Nowadays, asseverate is a rare, used mostly, as Mr. Leonard found out, by those who like to show off their vocabularies. Observe your behavior and ask yourself questions. What do you mean by that? Oh, that, yeah, self-reflection. So it's I mean, that's a, what that means to me. I don't know what the article, you know. Right. What the article is talking about with your behavior specifically is like, how do you behave in certain situations, right? So like when you're under stress, what do you do? Because different people do different things. Like, you know, it's a known phenomenon that stress causes physical illness and makes you feel bummed out, a sign that your goals are not working for you. So when we talk about what we value, if you're finding that you're really stressed a lot, you know, and just exhausted all the time, what the article is pointing out is that may be an indicator that you're not focusing on goals that are the best for you. It doesn't mean they're not important, doesn't mean they don't matter, and we all go through stress, but if that's how you're always feeling every day that you're doing a thing, 
you know, maybe we're not doing the right thing. And that goes with the asking yourself questions. I like the second part of the value question. We just talked about if there's a fire, what do you take with you? But let's flip this a little bit. And this is your next question, Lance. So um, in addition to possessions, right, what about personal qualities, being good, being fun, being honest? So let's do this hypothetical. If you were going to transport your consciousness from your body into a new body and you could pick which qualities are most important that you keep, what would they be? Is it a quality to say, to help young people? I suppose that, I suppose you'd have to narrow that down to like a skill that you're keeping. It's it's not. Because why well, it depends. Cause that's because that's a collective set of skills. Because that's not like a one. That's, that's where I believe that our focus should be. So whether it's being honest or being forthright or being a good friend or being a good mentor or whatever, it should all focus in on helping those who are coming up in the world. Because so, what qualities about you enable you to do that? Is it being know. caring? Is it? I don't know. <laughs> I've never been able to tell people. They asked me. They said you do a really good job at it. What is that? And I'm like, I don't know. Because to me, to me, educating or helping other people, and particularly in my case, young people in education today, as you guys, longtime listeners know, many people think that education is a science, and I think it is an art. Right. And so, how do you describe art? What makes the Mona Lisa a great painting? <laughs> you ask a hundred people, you'll get a hundred different answers. Well, maybe this. So, so when you ask me, uh, right? What what's the keep? quality? I don't know because to me, educating others, especially young people, is an art form. It's not a science. You don't do A plus B and get C. When I when I read this, I also thought about for some people who it's hard to answer. What would you keep? right? Like what qualities would you keep? It might be easier to answer what qualities would you get rid of? In other words, if I was going to move myself, my consciousness one from one mind to another, what are the things that I know I don't want to take with me? I'll get rid of my temper and my my (laughs) anger. Okay. That's that's simple. So now I keep everything else, which I don't know what those are. But but at the same time, in my defense, right? right? In my defense, that usually arises out of a passionate feeling that I have about protecting somebody or somebody not doing what they're supposed to do, or they're not being honest. They didn't do what they said they were going to do. So you would keep the passion. I keep the passion, but lose the anger. Okay. So we see, we found a quality to keep. Passion. Uh, Okay. There you go. You you, you did a good job with me on the, (laughs) on the couch here. (laughs) The, the back into it, you know? Well, sometimes, but that's again, that would be passion. That's why we're having the Because if you're not passionate about something, what are you doing in life? Yeah. Can you tell he's passionate about being if, passionate? If you're not working, <laughs> right. I mean, I, the, I'm, I'm you, you unlocked it there. You know, you unlocked Pandora's box there because it's passion is the key. That's the best way to describe the way I feel mm-hmm. about things. I mean, that, passion. that the things that are important. Well, you have to me. a passion for baseball too. I do. I mean, a passion for helping young people, but like you have a passion for that sport. And I have a, I have a passion to read. You know, I mean, it's like I have a passion about my family. So, I mean, the, the passion is the word. That would be. So how about you? I, I think that. Not that you're not passionate, but yeah. you, you, you tend to be a little quieter, even keel on the outside mm. yeah. than the friendly redneck liberal. <laughs> People pretty much know what my emotions are. I, I pretty much put okay. it out there. You um, you don't. So it's not that no. you're not passionate, but what do you think you're 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 what would you want to transfer to the new you to make sure that you you carried? Yeah, I I would so I know I would not want to transfer the indecisiveness. <laughs> Cuz that that I could definitely afford to leave behind. And I say that I the, like everything though, right? There's a flip side to it. Um I the, I think the the perceptive side with people and not, not necessarily because I can be pretty stupid about some things, but, but with people, uh, perceptiveness and, um, and, and I think the, the flip side of that indecisiveness is also the, uh, thoughtful consideration. So I'd like to keep the, 
there's a fine line, right, between like you've given this really good consideration and now you've just gone too far and you're going in circles. So I want to get rid of that part. I, I want to stop at the, it's kind of like passion and anger do go hand in hand because they often, one leads to the other or one is caused by the other. Often my indecisiveness is caused by the really trying to do a good job of examining different sides of something and, and, and come to a good decision. But then that can also be you get stuck in the Pandora's or you open the Pandora's box and there's no way to close it because now it's just <laughs> you become mired in the circle of right. making a decision. There, there's too many, yeah. too many factors to consider and you, and you can't come to it. But I really think, see, we passionate people don't have that problem. No, we just go forward. Just, right. And yeah. Like, just, oh crap. Sorry. I screwed up folks. Right. So, I mean, it's kind of a, from that standpoint, beg forgiveness rather than ask permission. <laughs> right. That's been my motto for 35 years. Yeah. So, but no, I think that, um, Figuring out, uh, I don't think I'm great at a lot of things, but the thing that I do think I'm, I'm hopefully pretty decent at is, is understanding different people's personalities and how to interact with them, getting along with almost anybody. There's people I like better than other people. Like there's people that I would choose to spend time with. You can. There are people that I just turn my back on and you stand there and talk to them. I'm like, Justin, you don't even like them. What are you doing? <laughs> Why are we yeah. wasting time here? Yep. And that's odd because I'm also not really an you're extrovert. Real, you're really but, an introvert. Yeah. But you don't want to ever hurt anybody's feelings. Exactly. That's the way I would say it. You're, yep. you're a very that's, caring individual. That's what it comes you're down to. You're a very caring individual. That's <laughs> Sometimes to a fault. <laughs> to a fault. So see, well, there's that. But you're caring. Interesting how all you of the care. things that we would keep are also, we would keep them in moderation. You know what I mean? Because, but again, that's why, why are we doing this? Because it tells us about what do we value and also what could we get better at? You know, um, when you figure out what you value, it also is, am I spending as much time on that or am I doing as good a job at those things as I would like to do? Maybe you are. But... And that's that introspection. Yes. That's constantly quizzing yourself to see if you're following what you say you believe in. So what are the last two things? We, we've, we've made it through uh, three. We've asked some very critical questions. Thankfully, the last two, I think, are way easier to oh, talk well, okay. about. Because now we, we, move... we know what easy meant in the first so, segment. Right. right. Now we move to external. We move to external things. So we're done with all this on the couch psychology and, and moving on. Right. Keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. We've done the deep dive inside, but how else can we figure out what we value? We've asked ourselves what we might save in a fire. What do we physically value? We've asked ourselves if we were transported from one body to another, what qualities would we take with us and what, what might we leave behind? And the way that we determine that was about two things, asking ourselves questions and also observing our own behavior, right? Um, you know, in other words, like look at yourself like you're a lab rat. How do you, what do you do in day-to-day -day life? And what does that tell you about what qualities you have, what you would keep, what you get rid of. So the last two things are learning from other people and exploring new possibilities. What may be less obvious to us once we become adults is the way that we can still learn about ourselves from others. Obviously, when we're children, we know, you know, we're, we're learning from teachers, from parents, from family, everything, right? It's all contributing. But once we're an adult, we can pay attention to other people's reactions to the things that we say and do. Sometimes these come in the form of explicit observations and advice, but more often they're spontaneous reactions that really aren't intended to give us any information. They're more just a genuine reaction from somebody else. Um, for example, the author says that when I remarked that I wasn't a competitive person and all of my friends laughed at me. Mm -hmm. It was a genuine reaction. They weren't trying to be funny. They honestly thought that was comical because they're like, uh, you're crazy competitive. <laughs> you know? exactly. So what do you mean you're not competitive? Right. So that's one of those. When, if you say a statement that you think about you and a group of people you care about are all like, no way, you know, maybe you need to think about that, right? Because they may know you better than you know yourself in that regard. Well, it's, when, as you're saying that, the name that pops into my head is George Washington. Because as the leader of a new country, he didn't surround himself with yes people, which is what you're talking about. Because if you always surround yourself with people who agree with you, then you're going to think very highly of yourself and maybe make some mistakes. Instead, he put Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, two people whose political views and moral views 
were the exact opposite and whose direction for the country was different. And he put them in, in charge of his government and said, okay, both of you talk to me and have your arguments with each other in front of me. And then me as the president, I will make that decision. I think that's what, that's as we've talked before on the show, that's that strong leader. He he didn't worry about them saying things to make him feel good about being president. He trusted their intelligence and their ability to think and to solve problems. And he wanted to hear what they had to say because he didn't have, Washington didn't have the ego. He didn't need to be the smartest person in the room. He had the power to make the decision. So he wanted to surround himself with people that were smarter than him so that he could learn from them and make the best decision for the country. And that's part of what the article points out is sometimes these insights are painful because they conflict with our official story of what we like to believe about ourselves. But that's why it's important to know, because knowing them lets you reexamine that official story. And if you don't like what the official story looks like, then maybe you want to change it. Well, perception is reality. If people perceive you that way, then that's what people really think about you. They're right. And if you don't want them to think about you in that way, then you need to change your behaviors. Yeah. So explore new possibilities. Um, I thought this this is a nice one to end with because it's, I think, something that we talk about all the time. You know, when it comes to thinking about values, we have to start where we are with the values that we already have. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't explore what else is out there. In so far as our values are undefined, and vague, we need to know the options for making them more specific. So, for example, if you ask Lance and I what matters to us, we might say family. So take family, for example. If you were raised to think that a family is two parents, two and a half children, and a dog, you may struggle with that value if you are uninterested in pair bonding, procreating, or pets. Discovering what else family can mean to people might help you understand how it can be valuable to you. And what does all that do? I mean, that's just one example with family, but the immediate thing I read when I did, it builds empathy, right? Sure. If you're not somebody that empathy comes naturally to, and that's something I've had to um, learn because, again, overthinking things, but my personality tends to be that I I can very easily uh, empathize with other people. But uh, it it can be to a fault, too, because I also fail to understand I get upset with people because they don't understand what I'm feeling and I know they don't. And it's like, well, why not? Why don't you understand that? You know, I'm being very clear with what my feelings and emotions are right now. How do you not get it? Exactly. Um, and, And that. And so but again, building that empathy with other people of understanding that we don't all think and process and feel the same way. And what is family to Lance may not be what's family to me. And by learning what it means to him, I may I may say, oh, gee, I want a few of those values because that sounds like that'd make me really happy. One of the best questions for this, exploring new possibilities and taking stock of, is your life comprised of the right things, is a question that the author was first asked by a career coach that was very simple. What do you do for play. I honestly had no idea what she was talking about. Play? You mean like card games? What she meant, of course, was something that I did for the joy of it. Not to tick off a box on my ever-expanding to-do list, not to make someone else happy, and not to improve my health. My first emotional reaction to this was a feeling of failure. Quote, I study well-being and I'm not doing that right. (laughs) Once I got over that, I had to think about what it meant that I couldn't identify anything in my life that really fit the bill. Play was something that I had to discover. So ask yourself that. What do you do for play? And remember, it can't benefit somebody else. You know, it cannot improve your wealth and it can't, uh, you know, be something that improves your physical health. So what do you do that's strictly for the enjoyment of it? You know, no other reason. It doesn't bring you some other benefit than joy. And if you can't pick something out, then that's why it's a good question is because maybe, maybe you need to find something that is, you know. It's my alone time. <laughs> I can tell you. I mean, it's, it's, I want to be alone. <laughs> I want to, I, I need to be alone because 
it sounds like I work for others, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an extrovert. I am a strong introvert. And all the testing I've ever taken being an educator, I'm a strong introvert. So for me to rack up the energy to you serve need to others, I need to recharge. And that's, if I don't get that, I, I get the stress. I feel the stress. I feel unhealthy. I get sick. There are times where I will walk into the office in our home or the study, whatever you'd like to call it, the library, um, and it's where all my books are. And I won't read anything. I'll just sit there, you know, for 10, 15 minutes and just look at the shelves and the different books. And But I won't actually read. You know, it's just being in the presence. And, and there's good uh, psychological, you know, information to support that being around books for most people is a very calming thing. Even if you're not somebody who reads, it just they elicit a certain level of calm for folks. And that's definitely true for me. So if I'm feeling that way, I can just go in there. I can turn on the, you know, the soft lamps in the room, not enough light to really read, but just sit there. It's quiet, you know, and be in that presence. And I think really what we're talking about, what Lance and I are both identifying is being in the moment, you know, letting, letting everything else just go away for a while and just exist and experience what's in front of you. Um, that may sound terribly boring to some people, but I, I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, <laughs> and it's I, very I refreshing. Very refreshing. Yep. I agree. So, all right. So why we do this show, Lance? Oh, cause just... you know, we got that thing called a mission oh. and here at True Chat, that mission is to educate people by providing honest, open and respectful conversations. And hopefully you've enjoyed today's show. Share it with others. You know where you can find us, you know, that Stitcher Overcast place, Spotify, Apple Podcast, you know, anywhere you can get a podcast, you can find the state of us. Tell your family and friends and, and join us every Tuesday and Thursday or whenever you get a chance to listen. If it's Friday and Saturday, that's okay. You know, you got two new every week. If you miss them, you can look them up and, and catch up all you want. There's what, 700 or something out there? I don't know. We need to do a count. Okay. I think we might be over 800 now. We're just so big. Well, see, I was close. Come on, I 700. Close. I, I showed so. Hey, I showed somebody the, the podcast today that I was at lunch with, and they're like, oh, I'm going to listen. They started scrolling through it, and they're like, wow, you guys have a lot of stuff. I'm like, yeah, you're not going to run out of things to listen to. That's right. <laughs> you can listen to us every day of the week. You might not like some of them, but there's, yeah. there's, there's a lot of Remember, stuff. Remember, we're not here to, to <laughs> make sure you like it. We're here to educate you with open and open respectful and honest <laughs> stuff. Uh, so new episodes. I can say that asseveratively. Uh, asseveratively. So new episodes are Tuesdays and Thursdays for the podcast, first thing in the mornings. You can also hear those same episodes on AM and FM radio stations, plus a bonus episode Whoa, on AM and bonus. FM radio stations. So you really got to, I mean, if you want the most of the state of us, you have to listen to the podcast so you get stuff right when it comes out and you're in the know. And then you listen again on the weekends because you'll probably hear something in those episodes that you already heard that you didn't know about. And you're going to hear an additional episode. If you can't find us on the radio, contact your local radio station and yeah, have what them the get heck? a hold of us. Yeah, that's right. And we can send it out to them. We're... We're in 20 plus states now in parts of Canada, and we'll, we're just going to chug away at ever, ever more, right? Just take them one by one. <laughs> uh, for the state of us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer Bradley Butch. Thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the champ. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.